Today on the Johnny Kaberg Show, within 24 months of Jesus' resurrection, what evidence shows that early Christians already believed in the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus? You may not know it, but a revolution is taking place today among critical New Testament scholars. And the consensus position is that the Apostle Paul received this information in 1 Corinthians 15, three through seven, as an earlier creed or sermon summary that documents Jesus' deity, death, burial, resurrection, and the appearances of Jesus to Peter, the 12 apostles, to over 500 people, the other apostles, and to his brother James by the time Paul saw the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus and was converted in 32 AD only two years after the resurrection. Further, many critical scholars believe this creed was in circulation even earlier. James D.G. Dunn, one of the world's top New Testament scholars who received his PhD from Cambridge says, this creed is just months from the cross. Larry W. Hurtado was a New Testament scholar and a member of the Liberal Jesus Seminar. He said, this creed was written and in circulation days after the resurrection. And probably the most well-known liberal theologian in America is Bart Ehrman, who claims to be an atheist. He says, I have no problem saying the early disciples thought they saw the risen Jesus. Why wouldn't I affirm that? It's a fact of history. E.P. Sanders calls himself a liberal and is retired from Duke University. He previously taught at Oxford. When he gives his list of accepted historical facts about Jesus, he notes that the disciples saw Jesus after his death and adds, I can't exactly tell you what Jesus looked like, but they saw him. And that's how far critical scholarship has come today. And that's what we're gonna talk about in our series with Dr. Gary Habermas the world's leading historical scholar on the resurrection of Jesus. Join us on this edition of the John Ankerberg Show and find out why scholars think the highest Christological statements about Jesus are found in the earliest creedal statements in the New Testament. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and as you've just heard, my guest is Dr. Gary Habermas. He's an expert on the resurrection of Jesus and the information that we find in all of the texts of scripture and even the church fathers and other historical uh, areas, he studied this. And our topic is very interesting today, that you're gonna learn something, I believe, if you watch the program today. And here's the idea that I want you to get in your mind. Picture the early Christians. They hear Jesus teach for three, four years, and the fact is then he comes to his trial and they're horrified to see he's tried, convicted, condemned to death. They watch a gruesome death on the cross. They see him buried and they're in despair. And then all of a sudden, three days later, he starts appearing. He appears to the women first. He appears then to the disciples. Then the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 says he appeared to over 500 people at one time. He appeared to a group called the Apostles, which seems to be more than just the 12. Then he appeared to his own brother, James, who had never believed in him his whole life. And then he appeared to other groups of people. And then he appeared to the Apostle Paul, who was actually Saul, who's out there trying to kill Christians. And he meets the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. All right, so all of this happens Let's say you're 40 days away from the fact of his crucifixion and we're at Pentecost and Peter stands up in front of the very city that had just watched Jesus crucified and he starts preaching. And 5,000 people put their faith in Jesus. Now, how do we know what Peter preached 40 days after the crucifixion and burial of Jesus? Well, these beliefs, these doctrines, what they taught about Jesus, these sermons, if you want, are reported and they're in what they call creedal information that is found in the New Testament. Creeds are just beliefs, the doctrines, the early reports 
of what Christians said to each other, because it wasn't written down. The apostles, when they saw the risen Jesus, didn't say, let's sit down and write the Gospels right now. They went out and preached, and the church exploded across the Roman Empire. All right? But along the way, the apostles, Jesus talked to them for 40 days. The fact is, what did he tell them? And what did they say? And what was the conversations among Christians about who Jesus was? This is what we call Christology, the beliefs about Christ that came from Jesus himself as they listened to him, what he taught them, and then how do we know what they talked about among themselves in their services, when they worshiped, when they, they sang their hymns. These are the things we want to talk about, and it's in this little word called creed that scholars like Dr. Habermas and skeptical scholars all across the world agree are actually early information that takes us back before even Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And I am fascinated with this topic, and I hope that you are too, because we're going to look at some of these creedal verses, and we're going to see the information that was there right at the very front, right when Christianity came out of the gate. Gary, I want to start with the fact of define what a creed is for the people. And you're right. Even starting to talk about it is, it may be the most exciting New Testament topic today. And the way I like to think of it is, if Jesus dies in 30, and the first New Testament book is First Thessalonians at 50, that's a nice round 20 years. Now, if the crucifixion, second most popular date, 33, and if Thessalonians, as some do it, back up to about 48, we're a mere 15 years between these events. And now your question posed is, is very insightful. You ask an evangelical, where do we fill these years in? And they'll probably say, look at the book of Acts. If you ask a critic, they are likely to say, look at the book of Acts. You think, oh, that's because Acts is uh, reliable, isn't it? Uh, they won't necessarily say that, but they're talking about two different things. Because in Acts, especially chapters 1 through 5, 10, and 13, there are a number of these early creedal statements. There's different kinds of creeds. In Acts, they're called sermon summaries. And what they do is up to 80% of Jesus, Paul's, Peter's, audiences, maybe 90%, are illiterate. But if you think today, how could somebody know, secular example, Mary had a little lamb, uh, religious example, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You could say the one, sing the second one, and not be able to write your name. So it's amazing. We teach preschool children to put these little row, row, row your boat. We could even sing them with parts and everything else and can't sign your name. So if you're going to spread the gospel and you want the essence to be there, but people, you don't have little Gospels of John to pass out. How do they get and keep the word? The creeds are oral testimony passed on until they become pretty standardized, written for the first time in 1 Thessalonians, for example. Now here's the, the question. What do these creeds key on and how do we recognize them? About 80% of the creeds key on the gospel teaching, deity, death, resurrection. Well. If I'm going to try to tell people what the essence of my faith is, I'm not going to say, row, row, row your boat, or maybe not even Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I would like to give a little ditty on the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And so they did. All right. Now, here's, here's the thing. I want to explain this to people. Let's say you're writing, folks, a term paper at school or grad school, yep. okay? Yep. And uh, you're writing along and you're using your words. And then you say, you know what, I think there's a real good section from the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I'm going to stick it right in here. And your teachers, who's reading your report, knows how you write and knows the words you use. And boy, I'll tell you what, that little quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica sure sounds a lot different than you. It yep. stands right out. Okay, when you come to the Greek Bible, most of us have English Bibles. Some of you, you'll find there's a little paragraph that's separated, and that they'll say, this is a hymn or this is a, a specific statement. Or you have something really easy, like Paul says, hey, what I received 
you know, I got from somebody else. He says it right out and then he tells you what it is, okay? And he uses different words than he uses. The scholar says that stands out like a neon sign, okay? But some of these other statements are put into chapters in the books of the Bible. The guys put them in there. And for the Greek scholars, the people that even even know Aramaic, they find certain words that are Aramaic and they find different words in the Greek and they just, it just stands out to them. And here's an example. You know, Bart Ehrman is a New Testament critic, probably the best known in America, and he has now said that he's an atheist. Okay? He can see these statements, but before he ever got there, somebody who was to the left of Bart Ehrman used to be Rudolf Bultmann. And Rudolf Bultmann, way back in 1976, before he died, he said, you know, this looks like a creedal statement. And he started outlining all of these passages, and he was a straight atheist, okay? I'm just saying the scholars can tell where the differences are at, and we're going to try to explain to you these things. And then I'm going to ask Gary, as we go through these things, we say they're pre-Pauline. That means if Paul saw the risen Jesus, as most scholars believe, two years after he was crucified, You've got 24 months there. How do we know that these creeds, this information that is called creeds, these little verses, these little nuggets, okay, that are in the text that we usually don't know, how do we know that they go back to those, that 24-month period? That's what we want to find out. And folks, here's what I want you to realize. These little creedal statements are accepted by virtually all of the scholars that are critical scholars. We're talking about atheists, skeptics, agnostics, whatever, Christians, the whole thing. These are accepted by them, and Gary has documented this, and it has changed the academic world in what the early Christians believed about Jesus. Where did they get this information? It looks like it goes right back to Jesus and the apostles themselves in this early time period right after Pentecost. Let me give Gary an example here. Let's look at some of these verses and one that's very, very interesting, one of the earliest creeds is this one here and it's found in 1 John 4 2. And it's a very simple statement. The earliest Christians were confident that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh because it says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Okay? Now, how do scholars know that that's early, and what was the importance of that verse? Well, let me take a second one first. It's of central importance because you're doing the gospel, and you start with Jesus coming, and when he appeared also bodily, you have a central doctrine, namely the resurrection of Jesus. And many of these creeds go through those. Uh, back to your example of the Encyclopedia Britannica, what I often like to say is, the better teacher you are and the more you know your student, the more you know the Britannica quote isn't your student. So if you go through there, and let's say you're in sixth grade and you're learning how to do academic things, and you don't footnote it because you've not learned how to do footnotes, you'll probably see a marginal comment, source, because the teacher knows it's not you. Now, in English, in many languages, we often use endnotes now. The, way, the equivalent, I like to think of it as the equivalent of an endnote would be 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 15, I gave you that which I also received. That's my way of saying, this isn't my source, I'm letting you know I got it from somebody else, I got it from another. Or Paul often says things like, here's a trustworthy saying, or observe the traditions of the elders. Those are hand-me-downs. And of course, some of them, well, virtually all the big name ones, were elders before Paul was an elder. Yeah. So that's a good start. All right, let me, let me go to a hymn that's a knockout. And almost every Bible will separate these verses. And so you don't have to guess about these. Uh, scholars just say, you know, let's just show you that this is a hymn that the Christians sang. And I'm just saying, listen to the words and the content of this song, this hymn that they sang, okay? And it is talking about the earliest Christians' belief in Jesus. And what I like is you take atheists like Bart Ehrman or any of the skeptical scholars that are heads of these departments of New Testament around the world, 
They all believe that Philippians is an accepted book, an authoritative book. Okay, it's one of their seven that they say, yeah, we'll accept that. That's from Paul. He's a scholar. And the fact is, you know, he was early and he knew all the key players. And so, yeah, this is this is a good book. And in that good book that they accept, you find this information. I want you to comment on this little hymn. Okay, it starts out Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then it says, who being in very nature God, Let's just stop there. The first words of the hymn, who being in very nature God, and the word is morphe, which is a, a fantastic word in the Greek. What does it mean? Yeah, morphe is heavy. Now in English, morphe means something like our English word form. If I said to you, hey, we're coming along pretty well on your house. We got it roughed in yesterday. Come on over and see the uh, two by fours before you put the, the drywall up. We would call that morphe. We would call that the form. It's only two by fours. Why do I want to come over there today? But in Greek, the primary definition of morphe is essence. It's more of a philosophical term. It's more like the insides, what makes it tick, not the two by fours that hold up the... So, so you, we might read that and say, they're a little overdoing it on the morphe. Not for Greeks, they're not. In fact, that's three times. There's three times in the New Testament where essence, ontological words are used of Jesus and their creeds. Another one is Hebrews 1.3, where we're told he was the exact representation of the Father's nature. When you start using language like that, that is heavy stuff. But why do they put it there at the beginning? Why the earliest sources? Yeah, there's a contrast. Let's go through it, okay? It starts out, who being in very nature God, then it says about Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, rather... You talk about the incarnation here. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, just explain that portion. Well, again, you've got, but by the way, humbled himself, became a servant, also morphe in the Greek. So in the Greek, morphe of God, morphe of a servant. That's quite the contrast. I mean, we talk about incarnation, but I mean, the fullness of the nature of deity, the fullness of the nature of humanity. And that's why that's looked at so seriously on verses on the incarnation. Yeah. Then it goes on and says, therefore God exalted him, talking about Jesus, to the highest place. This is still part of the hymn. And gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge. Now listen to what they're supposed to acknowledge, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is Lord, okay, to the glory of God the Father. Explain, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is from a book, Isaiah in the Old Testament, where God says, I will not share my glory with another. And here, the glory is explicitly being shared with somebody else, we would say, God's not sharing his glory with somebody else. This is his son. He means he's not going to give it to a human. And uh, so we're right there at the beginning. And by the way, if, if somebody says, uh, Philippians 2, Jesus called God there. Some, uh, some people who don't want to believe that will say, aha, I thought I could catch on this one. The Greek says he didn't selfishly grasp after that. That's not the verse we're talking about. We're talking about the Morphe verse, being in the form, the essence of God. Now, it's, my question to you is, everybody agrees it's a creed, okay? It's a hymn, right. and the information is, is the Christology about who Jesus was in early form. It was, wasn't even written down. This is just sung in their services, all right? How do we know it goes back to only two years after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave? I, I have two answers to that. And the first one is, there are some hints or indications. When John Klopperberg at the Jesus Seminar says that 1 Corinthians 15, 2 and 3 is a pre-Pauline uh, creed, and it's right in the, the, the headline of his article, when he says that, People who don't have to believe these things because their creeds don't teach those things, you know they've got to have some reasons. Now, it is a tough call 
to say, how do you know it's in those first two, those first two years? But two things I would say. First, I would refer to Richard Bauckham's comment that we've given before. And he's from Cambridge. Yes. And he's, and he's citing somebody else. But it's really a heavy comment when he says, the earliest Christology is the highest Christology. Philippians is an example. Coming out of the gates, we've used that phrase, you've got morphe right off the bat, or exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1.3. So they seem to be the candidates for early. But here's my follow-up. Let's just say, to appease the critic, and virtually nobody makes this move, but let's say that that creed is actually post-Pauline, it's from the late 30s. The, the key isn't what's the creed say and how early the creed is. The, the key is the material in the creed. And when Paul checks out the deity, death, resurrection, when he went to Jerusalem twice, checked out with Peter, James, and John, the big four along with Paul, when those four, and they added nothing to me, and they gave Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, that shows they're all on the same page. And most importantly, 1 Corinthians 15, 11, whether you ask them or whether you ask me, we're all preaching the same message. That's the most important one. So even if someone said, I just did my PhD dissertation, and that creed is probably five years after that, still early, I'd say that's not the important thing. The important thing is how old is the material? And when you get the material back to the original apostles, that came from the earliest time. Paul tells us he's the critic's darling. These are the big books. He interviewed them personally. Now we have a tight argument. So I would do it in reverse order. We know he got the content, and we think the creed is that early. So that's the way I would say it, a one-two punch for that creed being early. Yeah. The question is, where in the world did these early Christians come up with this information about Jesus? In other words, if it's, if it's right next to Jesus, and Jesus appeared for 40 days, plus his teachings before that, Okay, and his disciples are on the scene talking about this, and Paul comes along and he double checks it, okay, and then he preaches what everybody's double checked already, and this is in 24 months, okay. I'm just saying, where did this information come from? Because this is not Jewish theology, this is not pagan theology, this is completely brand new that Jesus Christ claimed to be God died on the cross, paid for the sins of the world, rose from the dead, and appeared to all of these people. Uh, let me use an illustration of a, um, an amusement park. If you're a roller coaster aficionado, there's two kinds that I'm familiar with. The one that goes ching, 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 and you're going up and you're all apprehensive of coming down. There's the other kind that starts at ground zero and they say, you all set, and you take off immediately. That's what we have here, the latter one. And most scholars are realized, they've been for about 30 years now, the kind of ride that starts out like this is the resurrection. Before then, Jesus made incredible claims. Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah. Wow, wow, this just blowing my mind. And he's living a life that seems like he's like that. But now he's dead, and we have Black Saturday. This is horrible, life doesn't get any worse than this. And then, what happened? He was raised from the dead. The resurrection is the dynamo that says, whoa, you know what? He must have been who he said he was. And you go, bingo, you were listening. All right, you, so. are, writing, you are writing a book where your bibliography is 4,000 different scholars, and you quote 2,000 that you think are the top scholars in the world, okay? And I'm saying, are you telling me that these people, 95% of these people, believe what we're talking about right now? Yeah, even if they don't believe in the resurrection, they will say that event proclaimed as the resurrection was the dynamo that shot the message out. We already had the message, but the resurrection caused us to say, the Father did something here. You know, you know this is really true. And that was what got them... Just like the roller coaster takes off like that, there they went to the earth, and they never stopped proclaiming it till our last breath. All right, folks, we're just getting started on this, and there's some more creeds that I want you to see, because we usually, in church, we never hear about this. We read our Bibles, we don't know this, all right? 
But I want you to see what the scholars, the top scholars in the world, in New Testament Christology, what they're talking about and what's persuaded them of all these things that we're talking about today, okay? So I hope you'll stay tuned. We're gonna do more conversation with uh, Dr. Gary Habermas next week. I hope you won't miss that. For the past century, secular historians have argued that the resurrection and deity of Jesus were teachings developed by Christians long after Jesus lived. But now there is evidence that shows within 24 months of his crucifixion, many historical facts and beliefs about Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection were known by early Christians and passed along to others. This evidence is found in early sermon summaries or belief statements of Christians called creedal statements. And we present this evidence in our two programs with Dr. Gary Habermas called What Did Christians Believe Within 24 Months of Jesus' Resurrection? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $29. Our second series is called Is There Scientific Evidence for Life After Death? Numerous scientific studies have been performed to evaluate the accounts of people who have been pronounced clinically dead. Yet surprisingly, some people have returned to life with amazing accounts of where they had been and what they had seen and heard. But their material, physical bodies never left the room where the doctors pronounced them dead. Such experiences compel scientists to ask, is there more to our lives than just our physical bodies? Is it proof that after our material bodies die, we continue to exist somewhere? If so, where? And since Jesus died and physically rose again, where does he say we will go after we die? The three programs in this series are called Is There Scientific Evidence for Life After Death? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $39. And then third, we're making available our recent series called The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection that even skeptics believe. Dr. Habermas explains why the majority of 4,000 critical New Testament scholars now agree on 12 historical facts about the deity, death, and resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. The five programs in this important series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. And finally, you may order all three of these series together, containing all 10 TV programs, for just $99 or you may order any one of these three series by themselves. But to order now, call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may order these series at our website at jashow.org.